Um, it's my absolute pleasure to, to introduce um, this first formal session of, um, of the conference on poetry and research. And we're really, really honored and delighted to host this at the Life Writing Center. Um, both poetry and research have so much to say uh, to life writing about the questions that it asks and are indeed themselves forms of life writing. It's a testimony to Amit Chowdhury's incredible versatility and energy as a writer that he appears here at this conference on, on poetry and research, um, as well as um, in many other guises as novelist and musician. Katie Collins and I had the great privilege of, of interviewing uh, Amit for a podcast a few months ago where he performed his music and he talked about his fiction. And here he is in his, in his guise as poet. So Amit, you're very, very welcome. Um, just a few words of introduction. Um, Amit Chowdhury is professor of creative writing at Ashoka University in India. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and honorary fellow of the Modern Language Association and of Balliol College here in Oxford. He's the author of seven novels, the latest of which is Friend of My Youth, which explores the boundary between living and writing. He's an essayist and musician, as I already said, and some of his major works of nonfiction include the really wonderful Finding the Raga, which came out earlier this year. Also, The Origins of Dislike, a selection of critical essays that appeared a couple of years ago. He's the author of a book of short stories, Further Versatility, and uh, relevant to today, um, a, th a third book of his poems, Ramanujan, came out just a few weeks ago. He's the editor of the Picador Vintage Book of Modern Indian Literature, and the, he has won numerous awards for, for his fiction, including the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction. Um, as well as, really importantly, the Government of India's Sahitya Academy Award. Amit, I'd now like to uh, turn to you with great pleasure and invite you to give your keynote. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Elika. Uh, great to see you and thank you for your introduction. And um, it was really wonderful to uh, hear that poem being read out loud. Um, it kind of put me at my ease in a sense, uh, because um, I was wondering what, I began to wonder what I was doing in this context, because um, uh, a few months ago, Katie had written to me and said, um, we'd like you to speak at this conference on on research and poetry. And, and I'd said, I've written a lot against research. Um, and um, would you like me to speak about you know, would you like me to speak against research? And and she said, we are all agog to hear what you say against research. You know, um, and and uh, and then I thought, you know, I've taken advantage of her uh, uh, feeling agog and and being polite. And um, and I mean, you know, what am I going to say over here? But 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 the but the poem kind of um, uh, articulates um, questions. You know. That, that probably we're going to be asking uh, in the course of the next uh, couple of days. Um, I mean, when I said, I mean, uh, when I said I'm against research, um, I was coming from a very particular uh, a place, a, 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 particular, a particular terrain, uh, and a terrain which has kind of emerged maybe in the last uh, 15, 20, no, I'm maybe even further back than then. And, and, and what, what I'm referring to, what is now being referred to, not in this context, but the context that I'm speaking of, the context that I'm defining myself against, what's being uh, um, referred to there as research has had many names. You know, research is just one of the, one of the words with which you kind of um, speak about a particular attitude to uh, 
material and to what a writer should be doing. And, and this has a particular, uh, um, particularly pressing meaning when it comes to the novelist, I think, the word research, and especially, uh, the, I, I would hazard to say the Indian novelist in English in the last 15 years. So, so which is why, you know, my, uh, I mean, Katie had helpfully uh, uh, decided on a title for my talk and just called it Against Research. And I said, can I change it? So I changed it to, you must do a lot of research. And this was me quoting somebody uh, a few years ago who when, you know, he asked me what I did and I said, I write novels. So again, I mean, this is another anomaly over here. I, I am a poet and, and poetry is my first love and I, and I don't want to make kind of uh, too much of a distinction between different kinds of writing. I feel uh, allied to poetry in as much as I, um, am, I, I, I feel an affinity with non-narrative forms. Uh, and my own uh, exploration of the novel is an attempt to sort, sort of use it as a non-narrative form. Um, but anyway, I said to this person, I, I'm a novelist, and, and uh, the person immediately said, you must do a lot of research. Um, so uh, my, my, by then I'd become kind of, um, I, I was, I'd heard this before, not not in the same words, but but I'd heard this kind of assumption before. I was, I was not getting inured to it. I was trying to think w what the answer to it should be. So I said to him, "Yes, uh, I I do I do research all the time. Um, um, I I don't do research for particular books. I, I'm researching all the time." Um, So I think uh, that's that's the kind of starting point for me over here, not to make uh, to to question to to question the sequence um, through which research or experience or whatever it is gets transformed into the end product. A po maybe poetry is such an end, is an end product where the the the, the process. The, the sequence breaks down and so we are never really sure what precedes the poem as research and what ends up as end product. But with the novel, there's an assumption that the novel is an end product of something. Uh, it could be experience and increasingly it could be research. And um, um, I haven't really, so, so I mean, there, there, are, there are genres and there are practices in which this sequence may not be as strictly adhered to as it is in our is it is in the model uh, of of the postcolonial novel or the or the historical novel. Um, where the historical novel is seen to be uh, a, rec a rigorous exercise in research to which narrative has been added. And uh, historians uh, uh, to see uh, the story as something to learn from in as much as they believe that what, what, uh, what defines um, imaginative writing is narrative. So historians want to bring in stories. The moment we put, put poetry or a non-narrative form into the equation, we are going into a more kind of complex relationship which hasn't been acknowledged. Historians who do research about a particular country or a history will say that, um, but there is a lot to learn about that particular historical novel and that historical novelist's approach to the same material. Uh, what they might learn from a non-narrative form, such as a poem, is something that hasn't been explored yet. So in a, in a way, implicitly narrative is uh, by the so social sciences uh, identified with the non-academic, the non-research, uh, the, 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 the kind of um, 
non-rigorous kind of ways of approaching the same material, uh, which, which might be of interest and open up things for, for the historian or the social scientist. There are musicians though, who uh, seem to kind of think of music as an ongoing piece of research and performance as a continuation of that uh, research activity. So I, I've seen commentators on Miles Davis talk about Miles Davis and uh, you know Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie as uh, um, rocket scientists and physicists. Uh, and I, I don't think they're making a a contrast there between uh, the sort of work that leads up to, to the performance on the part of these people. The performance is improvisatory, it's an unknown. Uh, it, 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 it is a continuation of all the research they've done into that particular practice. It's not the end product of it, it's a continuation of it. Um, and, and as we know, I mean, Miles Davis, um, you know, wouldn't give fixed compositions to his to the musicians he collaborated with. I mean, he, he'd give them a rough sketch of what to work with. I would say this, uh, the same holds true of Indian classical music of, of, a, uh, uh, of a performance in Indian classical music uh, in that we, we are sort of engaged in continual practice, which is another way of sort of saying research and the performance continues to be researched. So you can actually um, collaborate or play with or sing with a person you've never met before. Um, so uh, this, this has happened in my experience a lot of times that I'm performing with someone and for an hour and performing a very uh, a complicated improvisatory uh, a, or, uh, a piece of music, uh, but I've, and I'm totally dependent on the tabla player, but I've never met him before. That's the first time we are sort of sitting and playing together. So again, uh, there is a sort of blurring of, of, um, of, of, of a particular kind of model of research that we, uh, at least in India, and post-colonial studies have been using to look at the novel as, as, a, 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 as, a, as something that precedes and then feeds into, and then most importantly, legitimizes the end product. Um, in, in the context that we have now, and I don't know how true it is of um, the novel in America, uh, if one can make such a generalization about, about this category uh, or in Britain, but, but in, in, in India, certainly we are at this place where there is a kind of popular understanding that um, the novelist is a researcher and, 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 and that research legitimizes the novelist's activity. And in a way it legitimizes uh, the reader's activity of reading the novel, which otherwise is a um, is a questionable activity because you, you are not really doing something when you're reading a novel. And the question is also, what, what are you doing when you write a novel? Um, for a poet, uh, I think the question is even, uh, an even more difficult one to answer. I, I, I remember, I mean, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, the poet, the Indian poet saying, you know, that, that this was an embarrassment for him. At least he could say though, that he was a professor, that he taught literature. But when people ask him, what, what do you do? I mean, for him to say, I'm a poet, used to kind of flummox the, the, the person who was asking the question. And, and the person who said to me, you must do a lot of research was actually speaking on my behalf to kind of, you know, save me the embarrassment of saying, in a sense that I don't do anything. Um, I do a little more than the, than the poet does because novels are longer than, than in that case they take more work. But um, if they don't have any research in them, then 
what is one doing over that period of time, which is, you know, uh, a, a far longer period of time than it takes to write a poem. Uh, so in a sense, he was apologizing for me and also providing my, my alibi or my, my, my excuse by saying you must do a lot of research. So research is uh, um, a form of uh, legitimacy. It's part of a sequence. It's, it's what precedes the, the, what comes out at the end. And it's what legitimizes what, what happens, what comes out at the end. Um, it also has some, uh, it, it also makes some uh, presuppositions. So along with research, um, a few other words come into play which have an equal sanctity, just as research has now, the sanctity, the holiness of the legitimate and the legitimizing. The other words in India are um, archive and documentation. Uh, no historian uh, it can be a historian if they haven't visited the archive. The, and the archive is a shrine. It's like, it's like a church. You are part of a church if you've been to the archive. Documentation is what makes the archive possible. So all around me, buildings in Calcutta, which I think should be kept from destruction are being destroyed. But the social scientists have been saying to me quite early on, but have those buildings been documented? So I say to them, I don't want to spend too much time thinking about this because I want to find a way of conserving them, of, of addressing the law or changing it in a way that those buildings might say. But, but they say, but it's also very, very important uh, to have, and I think they're completely right, that these, that the buildings, their, their, their plans and uh, where they are, what kind of neighborhood they form should be documented. But then the act of documentation uh, gains its own uh, sanctity, a sanctity that, that comes into being for its own sake. Um, and, and documentation is one of those sacred terms that have emerged along with archives, connected with, to the archive and connected to research. The, the presence of the archive and the act of researching uh, supposes that the past is there it's there in the archive and it can be accessed and put together. I mean, what we need to do is visit the archive and then put together the past and thereby claim uh, some kind of mastery over it. So research then becomes an act, a, a, a demonstration of mastery, a demonstration that the past is there. It's different from the present, it happened some time ago, remnants of it remain in those documents and in the archive, uh, we can put it back together. And then what's put back together then can go into a novel. It can go into a book of history, but it also can go into a novel. And the novel then becomes uh, uh, an act of imagination as mastery. Uh, uh, a mastery that kind of is dependent on the belief that the past has happened and that we can know it. It has happened, therefore we can know it, we can master it. It is essential uh, for, if, if something is to be known and mastered, for it to be a fact, for it to have happened. If it is in the process of happening, we cannot entirely grasp it. Only what has happened can be mastered and known. Uh, what is in the process of happening cannot be fully grasped. So in that sense, does, does this mean that research and the novel cannot be about what can't be fully grasped about the sense of something happening? And is this why Roland Barthes says, clubs it together, the novel, the, the unreal time of novels, cosmogonies, and histories, and attributes to each one of these forms 
the simple past tense. Um, quoting Paul Valery, the, the Marchioness went out at five o'clock. All novels be, 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 uh, begin with a sentence of that kind. Um, once we are plunged into that unreal time inaugurated by the Marchioness went out at five o'clock, we are plunged into, he says, the unreal time of histories, novels, and cosmogenies. Um, once researchers have put together in the archive the past, then is it possible for them to narrate, as they often do, that history? Raja Ramon Rai was standing by the window. It was raining that day in nine, uh, 1798 or whatever. Uh, we have any number of histories like that and popular histories. Uh, people I like and admire. Uh, William Dalrymple has whole sections on, on in, in, in the past tends to do with how the, um, how the, 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 on the day of the mutiny in 1857, the so-called mutiny. Uh, all that is kind of, the, the, the assumption is made that the past happened, we put it together and now we, okay, we kind of still it with, with this narrative past tense. Um, I'm just going to read out a little bit, if, if that's okay, from Friend of My Youth. Um, is that okay, Alika? Um, uh, this, is, this is to kind of, uh, in, in, in this book, I kind of make a, a, a I mean, there, there is a little bit where I um, distinguish myself from, from the positions that I've been talking about. Um, and Friend of My Youth is about, uh, um, coincidentally, about a writer called Amit Chaudhary, who um, has written novels that have the same name as my novels. Uh, and and uh, he's gone off to the place where he grew up, Bombay, and he's visiting Bombay. And he visits it uh, twice. And the friend of his youth is a, a, a man called Ramu, who uh, has been a drug addict, and then he goes off into rehab, and then he comes back to Bombay. And this, this bit is about his third trip to Bombay in this very short book, um, where, he, uh, where Amit Chaudhary goes there not for a reading, not to do a reading as he did the first time, or to attend a literary festival as he did the second time, but to spend time there with his wife and daughter. Um, whom I have a name, but who probably would have the same names as my wife and daughter. But um, so this is the bit I'm going to read out. Um, I see Bombay sooner than I'd expected and Ramu. The reason is banal. Barely a month's passed. My daughter's annual exams are done. My wife has one of her bouts of intense longing. She's keen to leave everything everything being Calcutta. Jaisalmer, she says, for two decades, she's wanted to introduce me to Rajasthan, the forts, palaces, shrines, the brown horizons. But I'm resistant to history. I suppose I become uncooperative. Are you mad? Do you know how hot it will be? I have no interest in the peacocks. It turns out our daughter would tolerate going to Bombay. With its shops, cinemas, and cafes, Bombay history's very antithesis. And clearly you don't need an excuse, says my wife. She's at once resigned and invigorated. There's the prospect of much window shopping. Tell you what, I reply, let's stay at the Taj, the old wing. I'll gravel and wheedle a special rate. She stares at me. I don't splurge on hotels. They're taken care of by publishers and festivals. Holidays are combined with readings, a discounted package. And I've never stayed in the old wing. There was never a reason or opportunity. I plead for a reduction. I do my best to impress the manager. You know, I wrote about the Taj for the Guardian the day after 26 November. I see, sir, he says with the requisite gravity. I go on now shameless. 
Actually, a bit of my fifth novel describes the Taj. Out of a sense of decency, he gives me a near affordable rate for a sea-facing room. The outing remains a secret. I don't tell my daughter. I want to surprise her. My mother-in-law breaks it to her when they're together. I hear you'll be at the Taj. My daughter forgets to mention this, so we don't know that she knows till I tell her later. I hardly tell anyone in Bombay except Ramu. I don't want Janardhan, this is the publicity rep of the publishing company, to take over the visit. This is pure holiday. My wife and I resolve not to tell the wider world because it might be best that people don't know we are staying in a fancy place. It's sure to be held against us. By now, I'm well into a book. It's about Bombay. I've been writing it for a year. I tell my wife, it isn't a holiday for me. It's a research trip. It's a well-known fact that no novel is taken seriously in India until a, great, until a good deal of research has gone into it. This stay in the Taj will be my research. Going down the stairs will be research. So will looking out at the sea. In the meantime, because I'm writing, I'm thinking of Bombay. I think of Ramu. The Ramu I know and the Ramu I'm writing about have become indistinguishable. The same is true of the Bombay I'm recounting from experience and the Bombay I'm assembling through words. This is often how novels begin for me. There's a convergence. I live. Then something prompts me to write. The writing is not about life. It is a form of living. The two happen simultaneously. I love the title, Friend of My Youth, from an Alice Munro story. I haven't read the story. That's because the title must have implied a possibility. When that happens, when the title or first paragraph contains a promise, I become spellbound and keep returning to it. The work becomes irrelevant. The writer in me takes over from the reader and my inchoate premonition of what the story will be dominates the story itself. I've hoarded titles and paragraphs for this reason, but never followed through. Naturally, when I first fell in love with Alice Munro's title, I had no idea that I'd one day want to write about Ramu and Bombay. Ramu was still to vanish. The experience of feeling unexpectedly bereft was to come. So were the attacks of 26th November. As these and other events happened, it's as if the title knew it had to meet them halfway, sensed it and they had been traveling towards each other. The book is a novel. I'm pretty sure of that. What marks out a novel is this, the author and the narrator are not one. Even if by coincidence, they share the same name. The narrator's views, thoughts, observations, essentially the narrator's life are his or her own. The narrator might be created by the author, but is a mystery to him. The providence of his or her remarks and actions is never plain. Now, when I say over here that um, the writing is not about life, it is a form of living. The two happens simultaneously. I think this is a variation of what I said to that person. I'm, research, I'm doing research all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this is a kind of um, a modulation on, on, on the questions that, you know, I've been looking at here and a, uh, an attempt to distance myself from research as, from the sequence between research and work and uh, distance myself also as the idea of research as uh, legitimizing the work. Because if anything, these are uh, illegitimate things that I've talked about, looking out at the sea, uh, going down the stairs, in terms of research. So uh, um, there are other things I have to say, but we can talk about those. I mean, if you uh, want to ask me, Elika, or anybody else. Thank you so much, Amit. That was all so germane, I think, to um, the conversations that are going to unfold um, in these two days. Um, Incredibly inspiring to your, 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 your single-minded pursuit of the form of living 
rather than the about, you know, what is this, what is this piece of writing about? Writing is not about life. It is a form of living and that manifests also in musical practice and in singing um, as, as you know, well, we now, we now have about, um, gosh, about 20 or so um, uh, minutes for, for discussion and questions. Um, I have um, four panels. We have so many participants, wonderful. I have four panels um, of kind of names in front of me. So um, if, the, if the organizers could help me see hands, that would be fabulous. I will sort of keep dotting around. Um, maybe as while people are sort of thinking and digesting and 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 pondering, I I, I might um, begin with with um, a kind of a question, Amit. Um, I mean, you you were saying some you know interesting things about that very much resonated with me in my own practice um, um, about you know. Um, that that supposition um, that the novel requires um, archival research or um, you know book study in a way that poetry doesn't because poetry kind of you know the the romantic supposition is gushes forth and and that idea of of the novel requiring research is often something in um, you know university committees that allows a novelist. <laughs> To continue to to draw a salary um, for their work, whereas um, you know questions are asked about poets doing the same. Um, we can debate that too. Um, but I was wondering whether what you were saying about historical research and the novel, the post-colonial novel from India, perhaps also um, the American novel, um, is something that has to do with the address to a public, you know, that um, the address to an international public, there is a sort of this, there's this assumption that something from elsewhere requires kind of more work on the part of the reader and the writer to be universally understood, whereas poetry kind of assumes or is allowed to assume more of a universal voice. Um, so my question is really about platform and whether research is a kind of, is a way of ascending a platform for certain writers. Right. Thanks, uh, Elika. Um, I mean, uh, I think the, the, uh, the question of, of research as being, you know, the, the fact that a novel requires more work, I mean, that's been around for a long time, you know, uh, and, and, and it's been, um, it's, it's been a kind of definition of, of, of the novel, if you conceive of it, in terms of the 19th century novel, and this is how W.H. Auden saw it, I mean, he saw uh, the, the undertaking of novel writing almost as a kind of citizenly responsibility. Uh, and 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 he says the, the poets, in contrast, you know, go of fighting their skirmishes and battles and riding off, you know, while the novel, the, while the novelist has to become the whole of boredom itself. That's what he says, and he finds this admirable. He says the poets don't have the patience to do this, you know, um, and and um, it's it's it, it, he finds it fascinating that the the novelist should be a a kind of person who takes on that, that particular uh, responsibility, because one can't call it by any other name, of actually embracing everything uh, in a particular way to represent everything, you know? Um, to not kind of say like the poet, I will only write about this and in this way in, in six lines, you know? Uh, the novelist can't say that. Um, so so the, uh, Auden almost sees it as a, as a grown up, citizenly responsibility. The, the novel is a, a, a mark of, of having grown up, of having assumed your place in the world. A, a novelist is a grown up person in comparison to the poet because they have embraced 
citizenly responsibility in a sense. This is the 19th century novelist. I mean, then people come along uh, like Wolf and, you know, uh, not come, I mean, who, who, who was much admired by Auden, who, didn't, who did not um, terrorize him as un, unlike Jane Austen, who did. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, um, who did not terrorize him, partly maybe because she had mm, refused to take on that kind of responsibility. Um, so that, that thing of addressing the public, of taking on a kind of responsibility was always there. But here with research now in the post-colonial novel and the historical novel, and maybe the historical novel as a subset of the subgenre of the post-colonial novel, rather than the historical novel as in Wolf Hall, in the British novel, that, that's a different discussion. I mean, there might be overlaps, but um, in a novel, uh, in, a, in, a, in a genre that is Indian writing in English, I'm not even saying in the Indian novel, I'm not saying the Bengali novel, I'm not saying the Kannada novel, I'm saying the, the Indian novel in English uh, was already burdened with, with nation, with, with the anxiety mm -hmm. of, of the nation, you know. Uh, and mm, with, you know, the nation is a form of, is a source of legitimacy, just as research is. The ultimate source of legitimacy is the nation. So it was anyway dealing, it was anyway flirting with uh, shoring itself up on the legitimate and not knowing what to do without it, without that ground. Uh, I, I've, had to, I've had to face, I mean, I, I probably write crap novels, that, that might be a part, uh, kind of um, reason. But besides that, just the fact that I am not building on this ground, on this legitimate ground, that means uh, uh, one then begins to need to fashion a kind of vocabulary to describe what you're doing. Just as Arvind said, you know, when they asked me, what do I do? I have to kind of think about every poet from Shelley onwards has thought about, you know, um, you know, I mentioned this because of the defense of poetry has thought about, you know, how to answer this question, what, what do I do? You know, so in this sense, a novel, an Indian no novelist who's writing without the ground of the nation or then the legitimizing force of research, which is another offshoot of, 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 of a larger ground, is, um, is forced to then say what they're doing, explain what they're doing. What are you doing exactly then? Um, and the question of research, it doesn't, only apply to novelists, it applies to everybody who writes. The question of research. I mean, the, the poets don't figure in the discussion because poets have stopped figuring in the discussion where Anglophone India is concerned. You know, they, they've forgotten about that, that there is such a being uh, as, as the poet, you know, they've forgotten about that. Uh, I, I mean, the, the one poet who's spoken about Tagore uh, he wrote in Bengali, and he's only he's spoken about as Gun spoken about. He's not spoken about as a poet, but as a national symbol. Um, so, so uh, the intellectual, for instance, the word intellectual, like the word novelist or the word writer, like you know, literary festivals. I mean, you you go to a literary festival in India, maybe in in England as well. I mean, you see the pictures they made. But there's a golfer, there's a cricketer, and there's a there's an athlete, and there's a film star, and then there's a novelist. So the the, <laughs> the term has uh, widened, you know. Similarly, intellectual. The, uh, the, in, in India, it means a great deal uh, of, of of various things. Now, uh, but the ground of the nation, and in a sense of research, uh, has to be there in some way when you use that word. The people may not, these people may not think at all, but they must demonstrate that they're part, they're, they stand on that ground. So there, there is a, a there's, there was an essay in a magazine called Caravan, and I'll stop here and let other questions come in. But there was an uh, essay in an, uh, uh, some years ago in a magazine called Caravan by a friend of mine, uh, I like him a lot, Ramchandra Guha, who, who, wrote, a, uh, who wrote asking the question, why are all our intellectuals uh, left wing? How come we don't have any right wing intellectuals in India? Um, and, and, and then he said, well, the, the right wing, the so-called right wing intellectuals are all demagogues and, and they don't, while the left wing intellectuals research properly and then their articles are peer reviewed. This is what he said. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, so, you know, um, I thought here, here is the word intellectual metamorphosing into researcher, into a legitimate figure. Basically what Ram is talking about is a figure who's left in India make room for this illegitimate figure who might be writing novels or writing poetry or thinking. That's the other illegitimate kind of activity which we don't have a vocabulary with which to describe it, you know. So uh, research then becomes a ubiquitous uh, uh, legitimizing word. Thank you, Ahmed. There are two fantastic questions. Um, the one kind of follow -ups, follows up to the other um, from first Carmen Bugan and then uh, Malika Bukha. So, so I'm working with, um, and I have been working for the last few years with the secret police surveillance files um, of my family during the Cold War. And um, one of the projects that I have um, had was um, introducing the language of the surveillance file on my family. Um, that, that's the technical um, um, sort of orders and work orders as well as the, of the, as the transcripts of our conversations in the house because my father was a political dissident. I put those into the fabric of the poems. Now I'm talking here about producing and, and I think this is also the tradition of the other East European poets before me uh, from the 1930s on a literary testimony where poetry itself could be the subject of research. And so there are limitations there on telling the, you know, when you tell the truth and when you make a testimony, you do have a public obligation to um, not distort the material and to um, accurately portray. So what I am working on is the language of oppression and also the language of resistance, which I treat as life experience. So I wanted to, you know, you're talking is so fascinating when you're talking about the archive documentation and, and the creating a place and documenting a place of India um, in the minds of people through the novel. But I wanted to ask about, you know, your, your, your thoughts a bit more about what about poetry as a historical document itself? Can it be treated as that? And, and, and what is that slippery, you know, effusion of feeling coming into the, well, this is what historically has happened. Um, so this is uh, Malika's question, uh, um, following up to Carmen's. Um, she wants to ask about poetry from the post-colonial poet as testimony archive and embodiment, um, writing into the gaps of erasure as a poet. And the question is informed by a poet whose work has already been mentioned um, earlier by Katie Collins, poets like Kamal Brathwaite, whose poetry is investigative inquiry, investigating legacies from the middle passage imaginatively. So, so really two questions kind of about historical testimony and about very difficult and painful histories and how we articulate those through poetry. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you, great. Um, you know, um, I have I, I mean, two, two broad responses. Uh, to this, and they may be inadequate because they're they're too broad to kind of en encompass the specificity of what you're talking about. Because I don't actually know your texts, you know. Um, but but um, the first would would be that uh, everything should be available as material uh, to the creative artist. Um, including um, what, what you, you what you're mentioning. Uh, um, what, what did you say? Files on your family, investigative documents uh, um, about about your family. So uh, uh, 
you know the question is i mean how how we make use of these how we make use of the material um you know so, some sorry can you just can you just reiterate where you're from and where, where what the context of this kind of, of these files was yeah, so um, I come from uh, Romania and my father spent 12 years uh, protesting against the communist government there, um, against, the, well, the dictatorship of uh, Ceausescu. And um, during his imprisonment, um, the last few years of the Cold War, before we immigrated here as political refugees, before we immigrated in the States, we lived under 24-hour surveillance. So very recently, when the government uh, declassified the files, I have received you know, over 4,500 pages of material that documented every move. This has changed the character of my poetry. Um, and has, uh, the files have become part of the fabric of the poems as, as its own language. Yeah. And uh, so I've just published now Poetry and the Language of Oppression, a book of essays on poetics in politics um, to explain how I've dealt with that material. But I'm not alone. The Cold War surveillance, uh, I mean, from the Stasi files to, you know, all the East European surveillance, um, there are people who lived uh, being observed and being treated as... Uh, as um, animals in cage um, and, and the minds being controlled. So my work documents that effort, that specific language of oppression mm -hmm. that I think has intersections with oppression in other contexts. And this is what, where I'm saying that, yes, using the research in order to create the poetry, but creating the poetry in order to document something this is where the difficulty comes into, um, well, it limits your expression, yes? The, uh, one is, is not allowed to use metaphor in the same way as one would write um, a poem about an effusion of love, for example. Though it documents the way love breaks down and your own soul breaks down under, um, the government surveillance, that, that sense of authority, it's, it's, it's a document about authority and its power and the language of power. And also then with the expression comes um, the, the power of language to resist and to rebuild the soul and to regenerate the soul and to make it what it wants to be, that, that definition of liberty. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to talk about because I think there are um, there are connections with, uh, you know, poetry being, let's say, a definition of the soul, as I think about um, that soul being moved from one place to another. Um, so, uh, um, you know, again, I can only, uh, I mean, I find what you're saying fascinating. I, know I can only speculate about, you know, um, what approach you're taking or what, what, what it's ended up as in your work. But I mean, other examples, I mean, I've never done work of this kind, uh, but other examples come to mind in terms of things I've noticed uh, and, and they were coming to mind as you were speaking. I mean, um, somewhere near Angel Station, I went in, in, inside one of those markets and I uh, spent some time while trying to get a, a, a temporary mobile phone or something, I'd lost mine or whatever, looking at, uh, early days of CCTV footage inside that shop, you know? Um, and um, that was, that's one example that came to mind. The other one, the two other came to mind. The, the other one, uh, the second one was um, Iraq, uh, Baghdad. Uh, at the time it was being invaded, uh, the, the BBC used just one camera, which was a, a still camera which recorded what happened uh, over the day. I mean, there was nobody there to move the camera. So whenever there was a report, we would see what, what looked like a bridge uh, uh, on which cars were passing now and again. And at night you could see like fireworks, you know, the city was being bombed. Um, but otherwise it was completely still, you know, that, that there, was no, there was no value being added 
by the camera to what was being shown. What was being shown didn't have an intrinsic value either that was being added to it by narrative means or what you call metaphor even. Uh, boredom and everyday uh, uh, add unsuspected kind of dimensions uh, so that almost everything can extend our understanding of what can be done in the domain of representational art. I hesitate to use the word representation, though. also art, but you know what I'm talking about. That the, 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 the moment when uh, uh, living and writing or uh, you know, the break, that, that, that they come together. The third was, was there a school that was attacked in uh, Chechnya? Which part of Russia? I'm trying to, uh, in like about 20 Same. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Again, Chechnya, it was, yeah. yeah. Again, it was one of those first kind of instances of a camera that was trained just on the wall next to the school. So now and again, you would see uh, soldiers, uh, you know, rushing past, and then there would be nothing again. So the the, the patterns, call it call them narrative or whatever you want, were established by you, but not in the value laden sense that we have as readers or writers. Something else was coming into being over there as a form. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm not talking about aestheticizing it. I'm talking about the fact that how things, anything can enter into this domain and then disturb the sequence of gathering experience to writing about it, researching to then producing the work about the research. You know, uh, So that's in reply to your question. The other one was to do with, um, um, uh, the the, the uh, imagination, um, it's an example from Caribbean poetry, uh, Amit, the, the imagination as a way of, of going into history that hasn't been recorded. I mean, when I was uh, reading uh, um, Malika's question, I was thinking of, um, you know, that sequence in um, uh, Derek Walcott's uh, Omeros when a uh, shield, one of the characters in his dreams goes, walks the ocean floor back to Africa and kind of, you know, investigates the middle passage imaginatively in that way. And that was in my mind when I was reading the question. So it's about, I suppose, um, um, I'm putting words in, 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 <laughs> in, into the question here, but, but it's about how poetry might become a way of, of, um, of, of going into the gaps in history. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, a term like gaps in history, erasure, invisibility, visibility, they're so laden now that we have to re rejuvenate them through the act of, of, of writing anew, you know, uh, because, because otherwise these very concepts come uh, with, with values and, uh, ways of understanding their value uh, that, that are already pre-made by now. By now, words like gaps, silences, have a history and a prefabricated meaning. I'm sure that this is, uh, this is not what, what's being talked about here. The, the question is, how do we deal with that particular history of the pre-made in terms of how we understand gaps, identity, visibility, invisibility, and how do we look at the same things again uh, through poetry? I mean, I, I, I would say, for instance, that the opposition is not between the transcendental, the poetic, and the historical. A poetry and literature are ways of thinking, but differently from the social sciences about the same things, these things, you know? Uh, Tagore is thinking, for instance, a lot about history, you know, but not as, but he makes it very clear that he's not thinking about history or recovering history, in his case, Bengali history, as his contemporary historians are. In fact, one of the things that he is saying in, in some of his essays, but also his poetry is that, uh, that, that that history can only be experienced most acutely in our awareness of not being able to possess it. So this he does when he talks about reading. This is a poem from 
the 1880s, I think, called, called Megdut. It's, it's about reading a poem of the same, long poem of the same name called Megdut by Kalidas, the Sanskrit poem, which is also a long and strange poem in the sense that it's about, uh, um, uh, it's narrated or spoken by a man who is addressing a cloud. Megdut means cloud messenger. He's saying to the cloud, uh, can you take this message? Can you, can you go to my beloved and see what, you know, how she is? Uh, but, but there is a long sort of digression on the way where the deferral, the idea of deferral and, and what happens on the way takes over the actual kind of possibility of seeing the beloved. Um, now, whatever happens on the way for Tagore is his encounter with Ujjain and history and Kalidasa's world, whatever happened on the way, you know, this deferral. Um, so he says, I'm reading it, the rains, uh, it's raining outside. So, so Megdut, again, the, there's an invocation of rain because Meg, cloud is usually mentioned in, in India in connection with the, with the rains. It's not independent of the rains like it's, it is in, say, English literature. So, um, and it's raining outside, I'm reading Megdut. And then he enters that world, he, almost by accident. And he, as he enters that world, he enters the, the materiality and the specific, specificities of that world. And then at the end of the poem, his reading ends and as it were, he is bereft of that world. He is unable to access it anymore. The reading has ended. Now, it's in this that that history has become most acutely um, available to him. Uh, uh, so for him, what his contemporaries are doing, which is trying to create an archive of history is not enough. It's, it's through this inability to completely possess history that he says poetry thinks about it and experiences it most uh, acutely. So poetry at, uh, very early on is distinguishing itself from the social science idea of research and mas mastery uh, of history, distinguishing itself. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm all for looking into gaps and silences, but always being aware of this very language we're using while looking into those things. Thank you so much for um, for ending with a, wrote, a note of renewal and ceaselessly refreshing these questions that we bring to poetry. Thank you very, very much for the talk um, and thank you for the exploratory discussion. That was really, really great and invigorating. We've got so much to to be getting on with in these in these discussions across these two days. Thank you so, so much. Um...